Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, so tonight is the night before the pharmacology exam uh, for the Temple students. Um, it is November 9th, 2016. Um, it is about 6.09 p.m. Um, I'm going to start with um, just basically go over like medications and their indications and their, like it's for, for cardiac, sorry, their indications, their side effects. Um, stuff like that, and um, yeah, thanks for thanks for watching. So for um, for our first one that we're going to talk about, right, are ACE inhibitors, right? So they end in pril. Okay, so for example, lisinopril, ramipril, you know, whatever. It just needs to end in pril. If it doesn't end in pril, it's not an ACE inhibitor. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the mechanism of action. Um, for hypertension, okay? So the mechanism of action for hypertension is it prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. I would draw it on a board if I had one, but I don't have one. Um, so basically, ACE is um, angiotensin converting enzyme. And um, what it does is it it's between angiotensin 1 and 2, and it comes down and it allows angiotensin 1 to convert to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 leads to um, the renin-aldosterone system, um, which leads to vasoconstriction and sodium and water retention. Um, and that is not good when we have high blood pressure. So your ACE inhibitor will be inhibiting that ACE from working. Um, so if we think about it, um, it will, it will secrete sodium and water, right? But sodium and water are friends, but potassium and, and water or sodium, they hate each other, right? Absolutely hate each other. So let's say, um, let's say I didn't like this person named Bob, okay? So Bob is sodium, um, I'm Galia, um, so I... So I would go wherever Bob didn't go. Uh, so Bob left, I stayed. You know, Bob stayed, I left. So that's how you have to think about for this kind of um, thing is that potassium kind of like is uh, the opposite of sodium and water. Um, and sodium and water always go together. So like they're the BFFs, they're the Christina and Meredith of, um, of drugs, of not drugs, of um, substances. Um, so... That is basically um, the best explanation I can give you for the mechanism of action for an ACE inhibitor. Um, and let's talk about therapeutic uses. Um, so as we discussed, hypertension, um, heart failure, um, because it reduces the um, amount of fluid um, in the around the heart. Um, also, there's um, it slows the progression of um, al Bumin ureal or whatever. Um, so it's very uh, effective in in kidney disease, um, and it's beneficial in diabetic patients um, that have a diabetic neuropathy. Um, so let's talk about the contraindications. So angioedema, which means swelling of the eye around the eyes and the face and whatever. Um, that's most common in Asians, and then African Americans, and then whites, um, Caucasians. So uh, that is definitely a contraindication. If you have angioedema to a drug like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, we'll talk about that in a second, you do not want to take it. Like, why would you take it, right? Right. Thank you. Um, so the, contra in the other contraindication is pregnancy. So... Um, if your patient is on an ACE inhibitor, you need to tell them they need to use protection, contraception, whatever they want to do. They just cannot use the ACE inhibitor if they're pregnant because it really harms the fetus. Um, and so they, they always say that, you know, use contraception when you're on an ACE inhibitor. And if you have, if you detect you're pregnant, discontinue it right away. I mean, talk to the doctor. But talk, but after you talk to the doctor, he'll probably say discontinue it right away. Um, so um, or the or the nurse at your um, 
at your office. Uh, so the side effects, um, let's think about it. So remember that um, potassium is staying in because it doesn't like sodium, right? And sodium is leaving. So it's saying, oh good, my finally I have time to myself, right? So a side effect of this medication would be hyperkalemia, um, which means high potassium in your blood. Uh, so basically, um, that would mean it could be dysrhythmias, muscle weakness, um, symptoms like that. Um, and it's more of a risk in patients with renal impairment um, and potassium if they're taking potassium sparing diuretics, um, which is a diuretic um, that spares potassium. Um, I know that was really, really, you know, confusing, but it's a potassium diuretic. Um, so basically, um, to prevent it, you need to have good hydration. Um, and don't use salt substitutes because they usually contain potassium. So um, when a lot of times, like, the nurse will say, okay, you don't eat too much salt, you know, like, reduce your salt diet. And people will um, have potassium salt instead, not knowing. Um, and that's about all for hyperkalemia. Um, but obviously, like any medic, not obviously, um, like any medication uh, that is antihypertensive, usually um, it has a side effect of um, of hypotension and syncope. Um, so we want it to lower our, our blood pressure, but sometimes it lowers it too much, and that would be an adverse effect, right? Because we don't want someone to faint. We don't give someone a medicine and say, oh, hey, here's, this is here so you can faint, right? That's not, you know, that's not something we do. Um, so the next medication we're going to talk about is the angiotensin receptor blocker. So uh, it ends in sartin, S-A-R-T-N. An example would be low sartin, Okay. Um, mechanism action, really quickly, is um, it blocks angiotensin 2 from binding to the angiotensin 1 receptor, okay? And we already talked about what angiotensin 1 and 2 did, did, does, did, whatever. Um, so you can go back, you know, rewind if you want to re revisit uh, that. Um, so it's also, um, it's also used for hypertension. It's also used for heart failure. Um, and it's a drug of choice besides ACE inhibitors in um, patients with chronic renal, chronic kidney disease or renal disease, however you want to say it. Um, and the contraindications are pretty much the same as the ACE inhibitors. Their pregnancy and angioedema. Um, basically, uh, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs are very, very similar, except for the ACE inhibitors. Um, uh, some people develop a cough, a dry hacking cough, and it bothers them. So they usually switch them to uh, an ARB. Um, so that's about it for ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Let's see what we're doing next. Okay, um, this is, I like this one, calcium channel blockers. So um, the name tells it all. What, what do you think it's going to do? If it's a calcium channel blocker, it's going to block calcium, right? So calcium is needed to, uh, to, um, to make a muscle contraction. And... Um, Basically, potassium is in the cell, and sodium and calcium are outside the cell. And when sodium and, and calcium, when sodium and calcium um, can get in the cell, then they start a muscle contraction. But if we have a calcium blocker, then it's not going to let the calcium get through, and therefore there won't be a muscle muscle contraction of the heart. Um, so it's uh, it also works on vascular smooth muscle muscles. Um, and there are two different kinds. So there are the dihydropines, um, that end in P-I-N-E, pine, and there are the, um, non-dihydropines, which are, um, varamapil and diazepam, and, um, those are, so the, the non-hydrodipines drains are, um, are cardioselective, um, and the the dihydropines that treat hypertension, angina, stuff like that, they are not cardioselective. So uh, that is like a little breakdown on calcium channel blockers. Um, adverse effects. Let's go over really, really quick. 
Um, so for dihydropenes, um, you have reflex tachycardia because if your blood, if your pulse goes down too low, then your body's going to be like, oh shit, like I need, you know, I need to get, get my body back up. Um, and then peripheral edema, so you'll have swelling. Um, gum over overgrowth, which is like just the gum overgrowth. I know, it's disgusting. Um, and headache and flushing. Um, so when... Whatever you have, uh, usually in um, antihypertensive drugs, it that's some of the side effects. And then for non dihydropyridine, um, it is bradycardia, AV block, constipation, headache, and gum overgrowth. Um, okay, so now we're going to really fast go over it by diuretics. Um, we're not going to go over any of the other diuretics, uh, but thiazide diuretics will work for a will work for right now. Um, so the mechanism of action is to inhibit sodium reabsorption in the distal tubules. So if you can imagine um, having our, you know, little nephron loop. Um, oh, shoot, I didn't post that video. Okay, I'll post it. I'll post that one too. Um, look, at the, look at the video before this. Um, it's on fluid volume excess, and I talked about a lot about thiazide diuretics. Um, but let's just go over the adverse effects. So the adverse effects would be hypokalemia, right? Because it's really flushing you out. So any kind of electrolyte, we're pretty much flushing out. So hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypomagnesia, um, hypochlorinic acid, al alkalosis. But also we have hypercalcemia and hypercholesteremia, which is high cholesterol, hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugar, and hyperuremia, which is... Um, which is gout, because it's too much uric acid. Um, and, yeah, that's about it for the thiazide diuretics. Um, we, uh, we know that it doesn't start working for three to four weeks because it's, um, it's not immediate. Um, so contraindications are allergy to a sulfa drug, um, anurea, which is you can't pee, um, and, uh, if you, la you're lactating, so if you're breastfeeding, um, discontinue the drug. Um, also nurses should know, um, that patients should avoid prolonged exposure to the sun because you can be photosensitive from this. Um, okay, great. So then the next one is alpha-1 adrenergic blocker blockers. So, um, we're talking about um, anything that ends with zosin, Z-O-S-I-N. So it would be prazosin, terazosin, okay? Um, so the mechanism of action, if you think about what a beta-1 beta one receptor does, it's basically, you know, saying, screw you, beta-1. Like, we're, we're doing our own thing, right? And it, it, uh, it blocks. It goes, I, you know, you're not coming in here. So it basically dilates the blood vessels, decreases the peripheral vascular resistance. Um, and that could have an adverse effect of um, the first dose phenomenon, right? Because your body's not really uh, used to um, all everything being blocked at once, right? Um, so what it does is uh, it might get, it might give you orthostatic hypotension. Um, so we would uh, cause, we would tell our patients to be careful when getting up um, and down and whatever because it would be a low blood pressure when changing positions. Um, so next we're going to talk about alpha-2 agonist. Um, so an example of this is clonin cl clonidine. Um, and it's, uh, it stimulates the presynaptic alpha-2 receptors um, and it leads to re less release of norepinephrine. Um, so that makes reduction of the sympathetic outflow happen and um, in the brain and peripherally, and it decreases cardiac output, heart rate, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, okay, next we're going to do beta blockers. Sorry, this is going really, really fast. Feel free to re rewind me anytime you want. Um, I won't be offended because I probably won't even know you're doing it. Um, anyway, beta blockers. Um, they have lol at the end, L-O-L. So they're, ha ha, lol, beta blockers, lol. Okay, so it's the drug of choice for um, any patient younger than 50 um, for the treatment of hypertension with a history of a heart attack. Um, and 
and it's a car there's two different kinds of beta blockers like there are calcium channel blockers um the two different kinds are cardio selective and selective and non cardio non non cardio selective so the prototype for non cardio selective is propanolol um and the cardio the cardio type the prototype for cardio selective is atenolol um so these are pretty um heavy duty drugs that um they dilate blood vessels, um, they, they dilate blood vessels, um, decrease, I'm sorry, they don't dilate blood vessels, they decrease the heart rate, they decrease the cardiac output, and they decrease the secretion of renin, because remember that renin, um, is a vasoconstrictor, so I guess you could say that, um, it is a vasodilator, um, I just don't know if I would feel comfortable saying that. Um, okay, so the last one we would use to treat hypertension um, would be um, different direct acting, acting vasodilators, which these would dilate. Um, these are usually only used in hypertensive emergencies when we need to get the blood pressure down immediately. Um, so a few examples are um, nitroprusside, um, which is very, very potent, and it works on both arterioles and veins. Um, and if it's continued more than 72 hours, um, you need to measure the theocyanate. Um, and uh, toxicity would include seizures, muscle spasms, nausea, and vomiting. Um, and then the last one is hydrolazine and minocidil. Um, and it mainly acts on arterioles um, and it decreases blood pressure. Um, by triggering reflexive compensatory mechanisms with the sympathetic nervous system. Um, but a side effect of that is reflex tachycardia. Um, so let's see if there's any more that I can talk about really fast. Like any more that are different. Um, okay, so nitroglycerin is an organic nitrate, um, and it's used for um, angina. Um, angina is uh, not enough oxygen getting to the heart, um, myocardial ischemia. Um, so the mechanism of action is to dilate the, the uh, it's a vasodilator, um, and it decreases the preload and afterload. Um, so you can give this sublingually, or you can give this um, as an ointment, um, like on the skin. Um, if you're giving it as an ointment, make sure that you don't rub it in because that increases absorption. And also remember that you, um, so you don't rub it in, A, and B, you don't, um, you don't want to get it on yourself. Uh, put it on somewhere where there's not a lot of hair um, because that, you know, hair gets in the way of things. Um, so let's talk about administration of the sublingual. So the sublingual um, is you put it under the tongue, sublingual, um, and make sure to take vital signs prior to the admission of sublingual um, and hold it if the systolic blood pressure is um, less than 90 or the heart rate is greater than 100. Um, and administer as soon as the chest pain develops. Um, so you don't want to wait. You want it to be as like prophylactic as possible. Um, and for your prescription bottle, you'll get it in prescription bottle. Um, you have to remind the patient to um, change it every six months because it um, it deactivates in light. Um, and make sure that the patient keeps it in the same bottle um, again because it's deactivated by light. Um, and uh, basically the the deal is you take 0.4 milligrams every five minutes for 15 minutes um, for chest pain um, if you have a prescription for it at home. Uh, and then you call 911 if that's not working. Um, so let's talk about, excuse me, the adverse effects really fast. Um, so severe headache is like the most common adverse effect. You can treat that with Tylenol. Um, I'm sure you'd rather be having a headache than chest pains. Uh, severe anemia. Hypotension, hypovolemia, um, dizziness, syncope, and bradycardia. So basically all the kind of things that you would think when you're thinking about a vasodilator. Um, and then contraindications are hypersensitivity reactions always. 
um, severe anemia, hypotension and hypovolemia, nitrates um, with combined with uh, erectile dysfunction drugs such as Viagra um, can cause a life-threatening hypotension. So you want to not use those. Um, and then there's one more nitrate called isobride dinitrate, and it decreases the frequency of anginal um, episodes and also the severity, except for that it's not acute. Um, so it's, um, it's, it, you can increase the dose. You can titrate it until the patient has a headache. And then when you have, when they have a headache, then you know you can, you can't give them any more. Like, you can't give them the higher dose. Um, so we talked about beta blockers already. Um, calcium channel blockers we talked about. Calcium heart failure, we need to, wait, we, oh, okay, digoxin, this is a big one. Um, so digoxin, also called lenoxin, is a cardiac, like a side, it's a prototype. And um, the mechanism of action for heart failure is a um, positive inotropic effect, um, and it inhibits the sodium, potassium, adenosine, triphosphate um, enzyme. So it decreases the movement of sodium out of the myocardial cells, so calcium can enter, and that increases contractility. Um, so the it's given orally or IV. The therapeutic uh, therapeutic uh, range is very narrow, um, so you have to know this is zero point eight to two point zero milligrams per deciliter. I mean milligrams to 2.0 milligrams per milliliter. Um, so it must be reduced with renal disease, um, hypothyroidism, um, other things like that that can cause it to build up in your system. Um, and just remember that it can be toxic very easily um, and you could be at risk for it if you have renal impairment, um, hypokalemia, um, amiodarone and viramipil, um, increase the risk of digoxin, um, toxicity, toxicity, and, uh, hypoxia, uh, and hypothyroidism, as I, as I said. Um, so that's about it for digoxin that I'm going to talk about. Oh, antidote is important. Digibind binds with digoxin and takes it out of the tissue into the blood, which is pretty awesome. Um, and, uh, your when you test the level so it'll be high still um but but that you have you know that it's been binded and yeah um now really really fast the milrinone is a cardiotonic inotropic agent um it's only used in cardiac ICUs so um you probably won't see it that much um and the IV half life is 80 hours so, um, for a continuous infusion, it could be pretty dangerous um, because it keeps building up. And um, as I said, it increases the force of myocardial ventricles um, and vasodilation, um, and it increases um, CAMP. Um, and then the adverse effects are 12% people have a fatal ventricular dysrhythmia, um, and 3% have hypotension or a headache. Um, so... Contraindications is um, if you're in a, allergic to bisulfates, then probably don't take this. Um, okay, the next one is uh, nesteride, which is identical to human B-type natriatic peptide. Um, so it's a bolus dose, so it's like um, immediate, like, in, you know, you push, you push the medicine in, and then it's a continuous infusion. And the clearance of this drug is based off your body weight. Um, the peak is 15 minutes. Um, the action is um, to compensate for um, deteriorating cardiac function by reducing preload and afterload. Um, it also has a diuretic effect because um, it suppresses the renin angiotensin system. Um, and it decreases secretion of the neurotransmitter endothelin and norepinephrine, um, which relaxes smooth muscle. Um, as I said, it's used very infrequently, um, and contraindications include systolic blood pressure that's less than 90, cardiogenetic, and cardiogenetic genic shock. 
Um, that's, um, okay, the last part we're going to talk about is, um, dysrhythmias. I know this is a really long video, so, like, hang tight. Um, it's almost over. Um, so, cardiac dysrhythmias have, um, drug therapy based on class. So, um, as a pharmacology class at Temple, we have to know 1B. 1B is lidocaine. Um, so lidocaine, it's, um, a sodium channel blocker, um, and it decreases the autoenticity in the ventricles. Um, it's a rapid onset, so it's only in one to two minutes it starts working. Um, and it should be used for serious dysrhythmias. Um, and it metabolizes by the liver. Um, class 2 is beta blockers. Um, so the way I remember that is 2 is like beta 2. I don't know how. I don't know why that makes me remember that. But um, the mechanism of action, again, is to reduce the excitability of the heart and the cardiac like workload and the oxygen consumption. Um, and it's most commonly used to contra control ventricular contraction in AFib or A flutter. Um, or like VTAC, VFib, stuff like, not VFib, VTAC, supraventricular tachycardia. Um, and then adverse effects include bradycardia, SA or AV no nodule block, heart failure, um, bronchospasm, CNS changes because it is lipid soluble, and it can mask hypoglycemia. So you have to be really careful with your diabetic patients there. Um, okay, class three is the, cal the potassium channel blockers, um, which is amiodarone, um, and it blocks the potassium channels, which prolongs the duration of the action potential, slows the repolarization, and prolongs the refractory period. Um, so contraindications include hypersensitivity. So basically, um, a lot of things can be problems with um, the potassium channel blockers. Um, since it has iodine in it, you have to worry about thyroid disorders. Um, lactation, pregnancy, cardiogenic shock, heart block, bradycardia, hypokalemia, uh, sinus node dysfunction. Um, the oral formulation of amiodarone is to treat um, recurrent ventricle tachycardia or atrial or, fib or fibrillation, and um, it's used to maintain a normal sinus rhythm um, after conversion of AFib or A-flutter. Um, so the... Adverse effects that are life-threatening are, um, it's hepatotoxic, so make sure you liver, monitor the patient's liver function tests. Um, then cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, since we are giving a drug for cardiac dysrhythmias, usually we have an adverse effect of that, another, another dysrhythmia. Um, and, uh, pa yeah, okay, so that's about it for um, potassium channel blockers, um, although they, there is a lot of side, uh, side effects, so basically um, all of the above side effects. Um, <laughs> so class 4 calcium channel blockers um, are uh, ditiazem and viramipil, um, and this is only um, this is only cardioselective. So we talked about, um, we talked about these as uh, non-cardioselective. Um, the dihydropines, but these ones are not dihydropines. They stop the movement of calcium into um, the conductive cells, um, which reduces the automaticity of the SA and AV nodes, which slows conduction, which prolongs refractory period in the AV node, um, which is good for um, ventricular contractions um, and interactions. Um, amiodarone increases the risk of sinus arrest and decreases contractility and hypotension. Beta adrenergic blockers are additive, additive effects, um, cause additive, additive effects, and grapefruit juice is very potent and um, would increase the, um, would increase del, deltaizam. Um, okay, and then lastly, really fast, um, let's go over the unclassified dys antidysrhythmic. There's only two of them. There's um, adenosine, which acts like a calcium channel blocker, um, and it depresses the conduction of the AV node. Um, so its serum half-life is less than 10 seconds, so it needs to be rapid. It needs to be pushed immediately, and you have to be fast. You can't, like, if you push it too slowly, the medicine's going to come out of the system before you even finish putting it in. 
Um, so that's how fast it is. And then magnesium sulfate is um, the, for the treatment of torsades de pointes, um, where the QRS just go as absolutely nuts. Um, and it's a ma uh, it's good for management of digoxin induced um, dysrhythmias, and it decreases serum magnesium levels um, or potassium levels and and in calcium. So uh, look for hypo magnesia. Um, that's about it for today. Um, if you have any questions, um, email me. I probably won't get back to you until tomorrow, but email me. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thanks for watching. Just remember that I don't know everything. I'm just trying to help uh, everyone out. So, yeah. Um, please comment on the video, subscribe, whatever you want to do. Thanks.